The Mukadima Chapter 4 Part 1 Countries and Cities, 1. And all other, forms of, sedentary civilization. The conditions occurring there. Primary and secondary, considerations, in this connection. 1. Dynasties are prior to towns and cities. Towns and cities are secondary, products, of royal authority. The explanation for this is that building and city planning are features of sedentary culture brought about by luxury and tranquility, as we have mentioned before two such, features of sedentary culture, come after Bedouin life and the features that go with it. Furthermore, towns and cities with their monuments, three vast constructions, and large buildings, are set up for the masses and not for the few. Therefore, united effort and much cooperation are needed for them. They are not among the things that are necessary matters of general concern to human beings, in the sense that all human beings desire them or feel compelled to have them. As a matter of fact, human beings, must be forced and driven to, build cities. The stick of royal authority is what compels them, or they may be stimulated by promise of reward and compensation. Such reward, amounts to so large a sum that only royal authority and a dynasty can pay for it. Thus, dynasties and royal authority are absolutely necessary for the building of cities and the planning of towns. Then, when the town has been built and is all finished, as the builder saw fit and as the climatic and geographical conditions required, the life of the dynasty is the life of the town. If the dynasty is of short duration, life in the town will stop at the end of the dynasty. Its civilization will recede, and the town will fall into ruins. On the other hand, if the dynasty is of long duration and lasts a long time, new constructions will always go up in the town, the number of large mansions will increase, and the walls four of the town will extend farther and farther. Eventually, the layout of the town will cover a wide area, and the town will extend so far and so wide as to be, almost, beyond measurement. This happened in Baghdad and similar cities. The Katib mentioned in his history that in the time of al mamun the number of public baths in Baghdad reached 65,000. 5. Baghdad, included over 40 of the adjacent neighboring towns and cities. It was not just one town surrounded by one wall. Its population was much too large for that. The same was the case with al Kairawan, Cordoba and al madiya in Islamic times. It is the case with Egypt and Cairo at this time, so we are told. The dynasty that has built a certain town may be destroyed. Now, the mountainous and flat areas surrounding the city are a desert 5A that constantly provides for, an influx of, civilization, population. This, fact, then, will preserve the existence of, the town, and, the town will continue to live after the dynasty is dead. This situation, can be observed in Fez and Bougie in the west, and in the non-Arab Iraq in the east, which get their civilization, population, from the mountains. When the conditions of the inhabitants of the desert reach the utmost ease and, become most, profitable, the situation thus created causes the inhabitants of the desert to, look for the tranquility and quiet that human beings, desire by nature. Therefore, they settle in towns and cities and form an, urban, population. Or, it may happen that a town founded, by a dynasty now destroyed, has no opportunity to replenish its civilization, population, by a constant influx of settlers from a desert near the town. In this case, the destruction of the dynasty will leave it unprotected. It cannot be maintained. Its civilization will gradually decay, until its population is dispersed and gone. This happened in Baghdad, Egypt, Six and al Kufa in the east, and in al Kairawan, al Madiyat, and Kalat Bani Hamid Seven in the west, as well as in other cities. This should be understood. Frequently it happens that after the destruction of the original builders of, a town, that town, is used by another realm and dynasty as its capital and residence. This then makes it unnecessary for, the new dynasty, 
to build, another, town for itself as a settlement. In this case, the, new, dynasty will protect the town. Its buildings and constructions will increase in proportion to the improved circumstances and the luxury of the new dynasty. The life, of the new dynasty, gives, the town, another life. This has happened in contemporary Fez and Cairo. This should be considered, and God's secret, plans, for his creation should be understood. 2. Royal authority calls for urban settlement. This is because, when royal authority is obtained by tribes and groups, the tribes and groups, are forced to take possession of cities for two reasons. One of them is that royal authority causes, the people, to seek tranquility, restfulness, and relaxation, and to try to provide the aspects of civilization that were lacking in the desert. The second, reason, is that rivals and enemies can be expected to attack the realm, and one must defend oneself against them. A city situated in a district where, rivals of the dynasty, are found, may often become a place of refuge for a person who wants to attack, the tribes and groups in authority, and revolt against them and deprive them of the royal authority to which they have aspired Eight, he fortifies himself in the city and fights them, from there. Now, it is very difficult and troublesome to overpower a city 9 a city is worth a great number of soldiers, in that it offers protection from behind the walls and makes attacks difficult, and no great numbers or much power are needed. Power and group support are needed in war only for the sake of the steadfastness provided by the mutual affection, tribesmen, show each other in battle. The steadfastness of, people in a city, is assured by the walls of the city. Therefore, they do not need much group support or great numbers, for defense. The existence of a city and of rivals who fortify themselves in it thus eats into the strength of a nation desiring to gain control and breaks the impetus of its efforts in this respect. Therefore, if there are cities in the tribal territory of, a dynasty, the dynasty, will bring them under its control, in order to be safe from any weakening, of its power, should the cities fall under control of its rivals. If there are no cities, the dynasty will have to build a new, city, firstly, in order to complete the civilization of its realm and to be able to lessen its efforts, and, secondly, in order to use, the city, as a threat against those parties and groups within the dynasty that might desire power and might wish to resist. It is thus clear that royal authority calls for urban settlement and control of the cities. God has the power to execute his commands. 10. 3. Only a strong royal authority is able to construct large cities and high monuments. We have mentioned this before in connection with buildings and other dynastic monuments. 11. The size of monuments is proportionate to the importance of the various dynasties. The construction of cities can be achieved only by united effort, great numbers, and the cooperation of workers. When the dynasty is large and far flung, Workers are brought together from all regions, and their labor is employed in a common effort. Often, the work involves the help of machines, which multiply the power and strength needed to carry the loads required in building. Unaided, human strength would be insufficient. Among such machines are pulleys 12 and others. Many people who view the great monuments and constructions of the ancients, such as the reception hall of Khosrav, Iwan Kisra, the pyramids of Egypt, the arches of the Malga, at Carthage, and those of Churchill in the Macrib, think that the ancients erected them by their own, unaided, powers. Whether, they worked, as individuals or in groups. They imagine that the ancients had bodies proportionate to, those monuments, and that their bodies, consequently, were much taller, wider, and heavier than, our bodies so that there was the right proportion between, their bodies, and the physical strength from which such buildings resulted. They forget the importance of machines and pulleys and engineering skill implied in this connection. Many a traveled person can confirm what we have stated from his own observation of building, activities, and of the use of mechanics to transport building materials among the non-Arab dynasties concerned with such things.
The common people call most of the monuments of the ancients found at this time, Adite monuments, with reference to the people of Ad. The common people think that the buildings and constructions of Ad are so big because the bodies of, the Adites, were so big and their strength many times greater, than our strength. This is not so. We have many monuments of nations whose body measurements are well known to us. These monuments, are as big or bigger than such, famed monuments, as, for instance, the reception hall of Khosrav, Iwan Kisard, and the buildings of the Shia Ubaidid, Fatimids, in Afrikiyat, or those of the Sinhaja, whose monument, still visible to this day, is the minaret of Kalat Banu Hamid. The same applies to the building, activity, of the Aklabids in the mosque of al Kairawan, and of the Almohads in Rabat, Rabat al Fath, and to the Forty Years Building, activity, of Sultan Abul Hassan in Al Mansara. Opposite Tlemcen 13, it also applies to the arches supporting the aqueduct by means of which the inhabitants of Carthage brought water to their city, and which are still standing at this time. There are also other buildings and monuments, Hayakil, the history of whose builders, whether ancient or recent, is known to us, and we can be certain that the measurements of their bodies were not excessive. This belief is founded solely upon, the tales of, storytellers who eagerly tell stories about the people of Ad and Tahamid and the Amalekites. In fact, we find the houses of the Tahamid still existing at this time in Petra, where they are cut into the rock. It is established by, the sound tradition of, the Sahih that those houses actually were theirs 14 the Hijazi, pilgrim, caravan has passed by them for very many years, and it has been observed that those houses are not larger than usual inside, nor in size and height, generally. In their belief that, the ancients had excessively large bodies, the storytellers, exaggerate so much that they believe that Og, the son of Anak, one of the Amalekites, or Canaanites, 15 used to take fish fresh out of the water and cook them in the sun. They have that idea because they think that the heat of the sun is greater close to it. They do not know that the heat of the sun here among us is its light, because of the reflection of the rays when they hit the surface of the earth and the air. The sun itself is neither hot nor cold. It is a star of an uncomposed, substance, that gives light. Something of this was mentioned before in the second chapter, there we mentioned that, the size of the monuments 16 of, dynasties is proportionate to their original power. God creates whatever he wishes. 17. 4. Very large monuments are not built by one dynasty alone. The reason for this is the aforementioned need for cooperation and multiplication of human strength in any building activity. Sometimes buildings are so large that they are too much for, human, strength, whether it is on its own or multiplied by machines, as we have, just, stated. Therefore, the repeated application of similar strength is required over successive periods, until, the building, materializes. 1. Ruler, starts the construction. He is followed by another and, the second by, a third. Each of them does all he can to bring workers together in a common effort. Finally, the building, materializes, as it was planned, and then stands before our eyes. Those who live at a later period and see the building think that it was built by, but, a single dynasty. In this connection one should compare what the historians report about the construction of the Dam of Marib. Its construction was, started by, Saba B. Yashjab 18 he caused 70 rivers to flow into it. Death prevented him from completing it, and it was then completed by the Himyarite rulers who succeeded him. Something similar has been reported with regard to the construction of Carthage, its aqueduct, and the Adite Arches 19 supporting it. And the same is the case with most great buildings. This is confirmed by the great buildings of our own time. We find one ruler starting by laying out their foundations. Then, if the rulers who succeed him do not follow in his steps and complete, the building, it remains as it is, and is not completed as planned. Another confirmation of our theory is the fact that we find that, 
Later, dynasties are unable to tear down and destroy many great architectural monuments, even though destruction is much easier than construction, because destruction is returned to the origin, which is non-existence. While construction is the opposite of that 20 thus, when we find a building that our human strength is too weak to tear down, even though it is easy to tear something down. We realize that the strength used in starting such a monument must have been immense and that the building could not be the monument of a single dynasty. This is what happened to the Arabs with regard to the reception hall of Khosrav, Ewan Kisra. A.R. Rashid had the intention of tearing it down. He sent to Yahya B. Halid, who was in prison, and asked him for advice. Yahya said, O commander of the faithful, do not do it. Leave it standing. It shows the extent of the royal authority of your forefathers, who were able to take away the royal authority from the people who built such a monument. A.R. Rashid, however, mistrusted Yahya's advice. He said that Yahya was motivated by his affection for the non-Arabs and that he, A.R. Rashid, would indeed bring it down. He started to tear it down and made a concerted effort to this effect. He had pickaxes applied to it, and he had it heated by setting fire to it, and he had vinegar poured upon it. Still, after all these, efforts, he was unable, to tear it down. Fearful of the disgrace, involved in his inability to demolish the monument, he sent again to Yahya and asked him for advice, whether he should give up his efforts to tear it down. Yahya replied, Do not do that. Get on with it, so that it may not be said that the commander of the faithful and ruler of the Arabs was not able to tear down something that non-Arabs had built. Thus, A.R. Rashid recognized, his disgrace, and was unable to tear it down. 21 The same happened to al in his attempt, to tear down the pyramids in Egypt. He assembled workers to tear them down, but he did not have much success. The workers began by boring a hole into the pyramids, and they came to an interior chamber between the outer wall and walls farther inside. That was as far as they got in their attempt to tear, the pyramid, down. Their efforts are said to show to this day in the form of a visible hole. Some think that Al-Mamun found a buried treasure between the walls 22 and God knows better. The same applies to the arches of the Malga, at Carthage, which are still standing. At this time, the people of Tunis need stones for their buildings, and the craftsmen like the quality of the stones of the arches, of the aqueduct. For a long time, they have attempted to tear them down. However, even the smallest, part, of the walls comes down only after the greatest efforts. Parties assemble for the purpose. They are, a well-known, custom, and I have seen many of them in the days of my youth. God has power over everything. 23. 5. Requirements, for the planning of towns. And the consequences of neglecting those requirements. Towns are dwelling places that nations use when they have reached the desired goal of luxury and of the things that go with it. Then, they prefer tranquility and quiet and turn to using houses to dwell in. The purpose of, building towns is to have places for dwelling and shelter. Therefore, it is necessary in this connection to see to it that harmful things are kept away from the towns by protecting them against inroads by them, and that useful features are introduced and all the conveniences are made available in them. In connection with the protection of towns against harmful things, one should see to it that all the houses of the town are situated inside a protective wall. Furthermore, the town should be situated in an inaccessible place, either upon a rugged hill or surrounded by the sea or by a river, so that it can be reached only by crossing some sort of bridge 24 in that way, it will be difficult for an enemy to take the town. And its inaccessibility and fortress, character, will be increased many times. In connection with the protection of towns against harm that might arise from atmospheric phenomena, one should see to it that the air where the town is, to be situated, is good, in order to be safe from illness. When the air is stagnant and bad, or close to corrupt waters or putrid pools or swamps, it is speedily affected by putrescence as the result of being near these things, 
and it is unavoidable that, all, living beings who are there will speedily be affected by illness. This fact is confirmed by direct observation. Towns where no attention is paid to good air, have, as a rule, much illness. In the Makrib, Gabes in the Jarid, in Afrikiyat, is famous for that. Very few of its inhabitants or those who come there, from elsewhere, are spared some, form of, the putrid fever. It has been said that this, condition, is recent there, that it did not used to be that way. Al-Bakri 25 gives an account of how this happened. A copper vessel was found during an excavation there. The vessel was sealed with lead. The seal was broken, and, a puff of, smoke came out of the vessel and disappeared in the air. Feverous diseases began to occur in that place from that time on. Al-Bakri, meant to imply that the vessel contained some magic spell against, the occurrence of, pestilence, and that when it was gone its magic efficacy also disappeared. Therefore, putrescence and pestilence reappeared. The story is an example of the feeble beliefs and ideas of the common people. Al-Bakri was neither learned nor enlightened enough to reject such, a story, and see through its nonsensical character. He reported it as he had heard it. The truth lies in the fact that it mostly is the stagnancy of putrid air that causes the putrefaction of bodies and the occurrence of feverous diseases. When the wind gets into, the putrid air, and disperses it left and right, the effect of putrescence is lessened, and the occurrence of illness among living beings decreases correspondingly. When a place has many inhabitants and its people move around a great deal, the air necessarily is made to circulate and there originates a wind that gets into stagnant air 26 this, in turn, helps the air to keep moving and circulating. Where there are few inhabitants, the air is not helped to move and circulate, so it remains stagnant. Its putrescence increases and its harmfulness grows. When Afrikiya enjoyed a flourishing civilization and a large population, Gabes had many inhabitants whose constant activity helped to keep the air circulating and to keep the harm resulting from, stagnant air, at a minimum by dispersing it. There was not much putrescence or illness there at that time. But when the number of inhabitants, in Gabes, became fewer, the air there, which was putrefied through the corruption of the water, of the town, became stagnant, and putrescence and the occurrence of disease increased. This is the only correct explanation, of the prevalence of feverous diseases in Gabes. We have seen the contrary occur in places founded without regard for the quality of the air. At first they had few inhabitants, and, consequently, the occurrence of disease was high. Then, when the, number of, inhabitants increased, the situation changed. An example is the royal residence in Fez at this time which is called the New Town 27 many such, examples, exist in the world. If the reader will examine them, my statements will be found to be correct. As of recent times, 28 the corruption of the air has disappeared in Gabes, and the putrescence no longer exists there. The ruler of Tunis besieged Gabes and cut down the palm grove that surrounded the town. Part of, the town, was thus opened up and the surrounding air could circulate and the wines could get into it. Thus, the putrescence disappeared from the air. God governs all affairs. In connection with the importation of useful things and conveniences into towns, one must see to a number of matters 29 there is the water, problem. The place should be on a river, or springs with plenty of fresh water should be facing it. The existence of water near the place simplifies the water problem for the inhabitants, which is urgent. The existence of, water, will be a general convenience to them. Another utility in towns, for which one must provide, is good pastures for the livestock of, the inhabitants. Each householder needs domestic animals for breeding, for milk, and for riding. These animals, require pasturage. If the pastures, are nearby and good, that will be more convenient for them, because it is troublesome for them to have the pastures far away. Furthermore, one has to see to it that there are fields suitable for cultivation. Grain is the, basic, 
food. When the fields are near, the needed grain can be obtained more easily and quickly. Then, there also is the problem of a woods to supply firewood and building material. Firewood is a matter of general concern, as it is used for making fires to generate heat. Timber, too, is needed, for roofing and for the many other necessities for which timber is employed. One should also see to it that the town is situated close to the sea, to facilitate the importation of foreign goods from remote countries. However, this is not on the same level with the aforementioned requirements. All the requirements mentioned differ in importance according to the different needs and the necessity that exists for them on the part of the inhabitants. The founder of a town sometimes fails to make a good natural selection, or he sees only to what seems most important to him or his people, and does not think of the needs of others. The Arabs did that at the beginning of Islam when they founded towns in the Iraq, the Hijaz, 30 and Afriqiya. They saw only to what seemed important to them, namely, pastures for, their, camels and the trees and brackish water suitable to, camels. They did not see to it that there was water, for human consumption, fields for cultivation, firewood, or pastures for domestic animals such as cattle, sheep, goats, and so on. 31 among the cities, founded by the Arabs, were al Kairawan, al Kufa, al Basra, Sigil Mesa, and the like. These cities, were, therefore, very ready to fall into ruins, inasmuch as in connection with them no attention had been paid to the natural, requirements of towns. In connection with coastal towns situated on the sea, one must see to it that they are situated on a mountain or amidst a people sufficiently numerous to come to the support of the town when an enemy attacks it. The reason for this is that a town which is near the sea but does not have within its area tribes who share its group feeling, or is not situated in rugged mountain territory, is in danger of being attacked at night by surprise. Its enemies can easily attack it with a fleet and do harm to it. They can be sure that the city has no one to call to its support and that the urban population, accustomed to tranquility, has become dependent, on others for its protection, and does not know how to fight. Among, cities, of this type, for instance, are Alexandria in the east, and Tripoli, Bone, and Sale in the west. Tribes and groups living nearby, where a call for help or the sounds of fighting can reach them, and roads, too, rugged to be used by those who want to reach, the town, built upon a hilltop in mountainous country, constitute the principal defenses, of towns, against, their enemies. The enemies, will give up attacking the town. Its rugged situation stops them, and they fear that the town's call for help will be answered. This applies to Ceuta, Bougie, and even to Kalo, al 32 despite its small size. This should be understood. It may be illustrated by the fact that Alexandria was designated a border city by the Abbasids although the Abbasid propaganda extended beyond Alexandria to Barca, Barca, and Afriqiya. The term border city for Alexandria, expressed, Abbasid, fears that attacks, against Alexandria, could be made from the sea. Such fears were justified in the case of Alexandria because of its exposed situation. Its exposed situation, probably was the reason why Alexandria and Tripoli were attacked by the enemy in Islamic times on numerous occasions. 6. The Mosques and Venerated Buildings of the World It should be known that God singled out some places of the earth for special honor. He made them the homes of his worship. People who worship in them, receive a much greater reward and recompense, than people who worship elsewhere. God informed us about this situation through the tongues of his messengers and prophets, as an act of kindness to his servants and for the purpose of facilitating their ways to happiness. We know from the two sahis that the most excellent places on earth 33 are the three mosques of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Mecca is the house of Abraham. God commanded Abraham to build it and to exhort the people to make the pilgrimage thither. He and his son Ishmael built it, 
as is stated in the Quran 34 he fulfilled God's commandment in this respect. Ishmael dwelt there with Hagar and the Jerham, tribe, who lived with them, until they both died and were buried in the Hijra 35 of, the Kansas Ba. Jerusalem is the house of David and Solomon. God commanded them to build the mosque there and to erect its monuments, Hayakil. Many of the prophets, descendants of Isaac, were buried around it. Medina is the place to which our prophet emigrated when God commanded him to emigrate and to establish the religion of Islam there. He built his sacred mosque in Medina, and his noble burial place is on, Medina's, soil. These three mosques are the consolation of the Muslims, the desire of their hearts, and the sacred asylum of their religion. There are many well-known traditions about their excellence and the very great reward awaiting those who live near them and pray in them. We shall give, in the following pages, some references to the history of the origin of these three mosques and tell how they gradually developed and eventually made their full-fledged appearance in the world. Mecca is said to have originated when Adam built it opposite the much-frequented house. Thirty-six later on, Mecca was destroyed in the flood. There is no sound historical information in this connection on which one may rely. The information is merely derived from the indication in the verse of the Quran, and when Abraham raised the foundations of the house. 37. Then, God sent Abraham, whose story and that of his wife Sarah and her jealousy of Hagar are known. God revealed to Abraham that he should 38 separate from Hagar and exile her together with her son Ishmael to Paran, Faran, the mountains of Mecca beyond Syria and Allah. Abraham sent her out there and she reached the place of the house. There, she became thirsty, and God in his kindness caused the water of the well of Zamzam to gush forth for Hagar and Ishmael. He also caused a group of Jerhumites to pass by them. They took in Hagar and Ishmael and dwelt with them around the Zamzam, as is well known and stated in its proper place. Ishmael built a house for shelter where the Kansas Ba is situated. He built a circular hedge of doom palms around it and turned it into an enclosure for his sheep and goats. Abraham came several times from Syria to visit him. On his last visit, he was ordered to build the Kansas Ba on the site of the enclosure. He built it with the help of his son Ishmael. He exhorted the people to make pilgrimage to, the Kansas Ba. Ishmael stayed there. When his mother Hagar died, he buried her there. He himself continued to serve, the Kansas Ba, until he died. He was buried next to his mother Hagar, and his descendants took charge after him of the affairs of the house together with their maternal uncles from the Jerham. Then, after them, there came the Amalekites. The situation remained unchanged 39. People eagerly came there from all directions. There were all kinds of people descendants of Ishmael as well as others, from near and far. It has been reported that the Tubas used to make the pilgrimage to the house and to venerate it. It has also been reported that the Tuba called Tiban Azad Abu Karab 40 clothed it with curtains and striped Yemenite cloth and ordered it cleaned and had a key made for it. It has furthermore been reported that the Persians used to make pilgrimage to it and present sacrificial gifts to it. The two golden gazelles that Abdul Muttalib found when the Zamzam was excavated are said to have been one of the sacrificial gifts presented, to the Kansas Ba, by, the Persians. 41. The Jerham, as descendants of the maternal uncles of the children of Ishmael, continued their administration of the house after them. Eventually, the Huza ousted them and remained there after them, as long as God wanted them to remain. Then, the descendants of Ishmael became numerous and spread. They branched out into the Kainana, who, in turn, branched out into the Quraysh and others. The administration of the Kansas Ba by the Huza A deteriorated. The Quraysh took it away from them. They ousted them from the house and took possession of it themselves. Their chief at the time was Qzib. Kilab. He rebuilt the house and gave it a roof of doom palm and date palm boughs. al Ashai said, I swear by the two garments of the monk, of Al-Lajaj, and by, the building, that. 
was built by Qusi all alone and by Ibn Jerham 42. During the Korashite administration later on, the house was hit by a flood or, it is said, by a fire, and was destroyed. They, Quraysh, rebuilt it with money collected from their own property. A ship had been wrecked on the coast near Jeddah. They bought its wood for the roof, of the Kansas Ba. The height of its walls was, just, over a fathom, and they made them eighteen cubits, high. The door had been level with the ground, and they raised it, just, above one fathom in height, so that flood waters could not enter it. They did not have enough money to finish it. Therefore, they shortened its foundations, and omitted six cubits and one span. That area, they surrounded with a low wall. In making the circumambulation, of the Kansas Ba, one keeps outside this wall. This, area, is the Hijr. The house remained in this state, until Ibn Aziz Yubayr, who wanted to be caliph, fortified himself in Mecca. The armies of Yazid B. Muawiyah, under al Husayn B. Numair as Sakuni, advanced against him 43 in the year 64 683. The house was set afire, it is said, by means of Naphtha, which the armies of Yazid shot against Ibn Aziz Ubayr. Its walls began to crack. Ibn Aziz Ubayr had it torn down and rebuilt it most beautifully. There was a difference of opinion among the men around Muhammad with regard to the manner in which the Kansas Ba was to be reconstructed. Ibn Aziz Ubayr argued against the others with the following remark, which the Messenger of God had made to Aisha, If your people had not but recently been unbelievers, I would have restored the house on the foundations of Abraham and I would have made two doors for it. An Eastern and a Western One 44. Ibn Aziz Ubayr therefore, tore it down and laid bare the foundations of Abraham. He assembled the great personalities and dignitaries, of Mecca, to look at them. Ibn. Abbas advised him to think of preserving the Qibla for the people, during the reconstruction. Therefore, he set up a wooden scaffolding over the foundations and placed curtains over it, in order to preserve the Qibla, and keep it visible as a temporary measure. He sent to Sana for gypsum and quicklime, which he had brought back, to Mecca. He asked about the original stone quarry used in constructing, the Kansas Ba. As many stones as were needed by him were brought together. Then, he started construction over the foundations of Abraham. He built the walls twenty-seven cubits high, and he made two doors for, the Kansas Ba, on a level with the ground, as it was said in the tradition, Quoted. He made floors and wall coverings of marble for, the Kansas Ba, and he had keys and doors of gold fashioned for it. Later on, in the days of Abd al Malik, al Hajjaj came to besiege Ibn Aziz Ubayr. He bombarded the mosque from Mangonels until its walls cracked. After Ibn Aziz Ubayr's defeat, al Hajjaj consulted Abd al Malik concerning Ibn Eight Subayr's reconstruction of the house and additions to it. Abd al-Malik ordered him to tear it down and rebuild it upon the foundations of the Quraysh. The Kansas Ba has this, appearance, today. It is said that he, Abd al-Malik, regretted his action when he learned that Ibn Aziz Ubayr's transmission of the tradition of Aisha was a sound one. He said, I wish I had left it to Abu Qubayb, Ibn Aziz Ubayr, to rebuild the house as he had undertaken to do it. 45. al Hajjaj tore down six cubits in a span of, the Kansas Ba, where the Hajj is, and rebuilt, the Kansas Ba, upon the foundations of the Quraysh. He walled in the western door and that part of the eastern door that today is below the threshold. He left the rest entirely unchanged. The whole building as it now stands is the building of Ibn Aziz Ubayr. In the wall, between his building and that of al Hajjaj, one can distinctly see a crack in the wall where the two buildings are connected. The one construction is separated from the other by a crack in the wall, originally one finger wide, now repaired. There is a weighty problem here. The situation described, 
is in disagreement with what the jurists say relative to circumambulation, of the Kansas Ba. The person who makes the circumambulation must be careful not to lean over the Shadar 1 under structure 46 running underneath the foundation walls. Were he to do so, his circumambulation would be inside the house. This, restriction, is based upon the assumption that the walls cover only a part of the foundations, a part that is not covered by the walls being where the Shadar 1 under structure is. The jurists, also state with regard to kissing the black stone, that the person who makes the circumambulation must straighten up again when he has kissed the black stone, lest part of his circumambulation be inside the house. Now, if all the walls belong to the building of Ibn Aziz Ubayr, which was erected upon the foundations of Abraham, how could there occur what, the jurists, say could occur, namely, that unless due caution is practiced, part of the circumambulation might fall inside the Kansas Ba. There is no escape from, the difficulty, except by assuming one of two alternatives. al hajjaj may have torn down the hole and rebuilt it, as a number of persons have reported, but not covered the whole of Ibn Aziz Ubayr's foundation. However, this assumption is refuted by the crack visible between the two buildings and the differences of technical detail between the upper and lower parts. The other alternative would be that Ibn Aziz Ubayr did not fully restore the house upon the foundations of Abraham. He would only have done this in the case of the Hijr, so as to include it. The Kansas Ba, today, although built by Ibn Aziz Ubayr, would thus not be on the foundations of Abraham. This is unlikely. But it is one of the two possible alternatives. And God knows better. The area, courtyard, around the house, that is, the mosque, was an open space to be used by those who were making the circumambulation. In the days of the Prophet and his successor, Abu Bakr, there were no walls surrounding it. Then the number of people, who made pilgrimage to the Kansas Ba, increased. Omer bought the, adjacent, houses and had them torn down, and added their, sites, to the mosque, area. He surrounded it with walls less than a fathom high. The same was done, successively, by Uthman, Ibn Aziz Ubayr, and Al-Walid B. Abd al-Malik. The latter rebuilt, the mosque, with marble columns. Al-Mansur and his son and successor Al-Mahdi added to it. Subsequently, no further additions were made, and the mosque has remained as it was then down to our time. Indications that God has honored the house and been greatly concerned with it are too impressive for them all to be recorded. It is sufficient to mention that he made it the place where the revelation and the angels came down, and a place for worship and fulfillment of the religious duties and rites of pilgrimage. The sacred precinct of the house has been singled out for more venerable rites and privileges than any other place. God has forbidden anyone who opposes the religion of Islam to enter the sacred precinct. He enjoined those who enter it to wear no sewn garments but a piece of cloth, Izar, to cover THEM47 he has granted asylum and protection against all harm to those who take refuge in it and to the cattle that graze on its pastures. No one has anything to fear there. No wild animal is hunted there. No tree is cut down for firewood. The limits of the sacred precinct, which is invested with so much sanctity, extend, in the direction of Medina, 3 miles to Atan Iam, 48 in the direction of the Iraq, 7 miles to the pass of the mountain of al munqata in the direction of al Jirana, 9 miles to ash Shibi, 49 in the direction of at taif 7 miles to batun Namara, and, in the direction of Jeddah, 10 miles to Munqata al ashair This is the importance and history of Mecca. Mecca is called the mother of villages. 50 The name of the Kansas Ba is derived from Kansas B, cube, because of its heights 51. Mecca is also called Baka 52 Al Asma I 53 says, it is called Baka, because the people squeezed, Baka, that is, pushed each other toward it. Mujahid 54 says, the B of Baka was changed into M, as one says Lazim and Lazab clinging, adhering because of the proximity of the place of articulation of the two sounds. 
And Naka I-55 says, Baka means the house, and Mecca the place. Az. Zuri 56 says, Baka means the whole mosque, and Mecca the sacred precinct. Ever since pre-Islamic times, Mecca has been honored by the nations. Their rulers sent property and treasures there. This was done, for instance, by the Persian emperor, Khosrav, and others. The story of the swords and the two gazelles that Abd al-Muttalib found when the Zamzam was excavated is well known 57. During the conquest of Mecca, the Messenger of God found in the cistern there 70,000 ounces of gold, which were gifts to the house by the rulers, of the foreign nations. Their value was 2 million dinars of a weight of 200 hundredweight. Ali B. Abi Talib told Muhammad that he should use the money for his war, but Muhammad did not do that. He, Ali, later on mentioned, the same thing, to Abu Bakr, but he could not move him. This is stated by Alay's Rakt 58 in Al-Bukhari, there is the following story with a chain of transmitters going back to Abu Wail, 59 who said, I was with Sheba B. Uthman 60 he said, Omar B. Al-Khattab was with me. He said, My intention is not to leave any gold or silver in Mecca, but I shall distribute it among the Muslims. I replied, You will not do that. He asked, Why? I said, Because, it was not done by your two masters, Saib. He said, They are the two men who must be taken as models. The story was, also, published by Abu Dayyad and IBN Majah 61. The money remained, in Mecca, up to the time of the disturbance caused by Al-Aftaz, that is, Al-Husayn B. Al-Hasan B. Ali B. Ali Zain al-Abidin, in the year 199-815-62 when, Al-Aftaz, conquered Mecca, he went to the Kansas Ba and took everything that was in the treasury. He said, what would the Kansas Ba do with that money? It lies there unused. We are more entitled to use it for our war, than is the Kansas Ba to hold it. So he took it out and used it. Since then, there has been no treasure in the Kansas Ba. Jerusalem is the most remote mosque. 63 It began in the time of the Sabians as the site of a temple to Venus. The Sabians used oil as a sacrificial offering and poured it upon the rock that was there. The temple, of Venus, was later on totally destroyed. The children of Israel, when they took possession of, Jerusalem, used it as the Qibla for their prayers. This happened in the following manner, Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, in order to give them possession of Jerusalem, as God had promised to their father Israel and his fathers Isaac and Jacob 64 before him. Now, while they were staying in the desert, God commanded Moses to use a tabernacle 65 of acacia wood, whose measurements, description, effigies, hayakil, 66 and statues were indicated, to Moses, in a revelation. The tabernacle was to contain an ark, a table with plates, and a candle Abram with candles, and, Moses was to, make an altar for sacrifices. All this is very fully described in the Torah. Moses made the tabernacle and placed in it the Ark of the Covenant, that is, the Ark in which were kept the tablets fashioned in replacement of the tablets that had been sent down with the Ten Commandments and had been broken, and he placed the altar near it. God told Moses that Aaron should be in charge of the sacrifices. The Israelites, set up the tabernacle among their tents in the desert. They prayed to it, offered their sacrifices upon the altar in front of it and went there in order to receive revelations. When they took possession of Syria, 67 they deposited it in Gilgal in the holy land between Benjamin and Ephraim. The tabernacle remained there 14 years, for 7 years of war, and for 7 years after the conquest, when the country was being divided. When Joshua died, the Israelites transferred it to Shiloh, close to Gilgal, and surrounded it with walls. It remained in this situation for 300 years, until the Philistines took it away from, the Israelites, as was mentioned before, 
68 and achieved superiority over them. Then, the Philistines, returned the tabernacle. After the death of Eli the priest, the Israelites transferred the tabernacle to Nob. Later on, in the days of Saul, it was transferred to Gibeon 69 in the land of Benjamin. When David became ruler, he transferred the tabernacle and the ark to Jerusalem. He made a special tent for it, and placed it upon the rock. The tabernacle remained the Qibla of, the Israelites. David wanted to build a temple upon the rock in its place, but he was not able to complete it. He charged his son Solomon to take care of, the building of the temple. Solomon built it in the fourth year of his reign, 500 years after the death of Moses. He made its columns of bronze, and he placed the glass pavilion 70 in it. He covered the doors and the walls with gold. He also used gold in fashioning its effigies, hayakil, statues, vessels, chandeliers, and keys. He made the back, room, 71 in, the form of, a vault. In it, the Ark of the Covenant was to be placed. He brought it from Zion, the place of his father David. The tribes and priests carried it, and it was deposited in the vault. The tabernacle, the vessels, and the altar were put in the places prepared for them in the mosque. Things remained that way as long as God wished. Later on, the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, 800 years after its construction. Nebuchadnezzar burned the Torah and the staff, of Moses, melted the effigies, Hayakil, and scattered the stones. Later on, the Persian rulers permitted the children of Israel to return. Ezra, the Israelite prophet at that time, rebuilt, the temple, with the help of the Persian ruler, Baman, Artaxerxes, who owed his birth to the children of Israel who were led into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar 72, Baman, 73 set limits upon the reconstruction of, the temple, by, the Israelites, which made it a smaller building than that of Solomon. The Israelites, did not go beyond that plan. The 74 vaulted halls underneath the temple and two superimposed stories, the columns of the upper story of which rest upon the vault of the lower story, are thought by many people to have been Solomon's stables. This is not so. The vaulted halls were built in order to avoid any contamination of the temple in Jerusalem. According to Jewish law, something unclean that is deep down in the earth and separated from the surface by a layer of earth, so that a straight line would connect the unclean object in the earth with the object on the surface, could be suspected of making the object on the surface unclean. And a suspicion has the same implication as a fact in, Jewish legal, opinion. Therefore, the Israelites, built these vaulted halls in this form, with the columns of the upper 75 hall resting upon the vaults of, the lower, so that there would be no straight line, between the object underground and the object upon the surface, along which contamination could spread. And thus any suspicion of the contamination of the temple was avoided. This makes for greater ritual cleanliness and holiness for the temple 76. Then, the Greek, Persian, and Roman rulers successively had control over the children of Israel. During that period, a flourishing royal authority was enjoyed by the children of Israel and exercised by the Hasmoneans who were, Jewish, priests. The Hasmoneans, in turn, were succeeded by Herod, a relative of theirs by marriage, and by his children. Herod rebuilt, the temple in, Jerusalem very splendidly, after the plan of Solomon. He completed it in six years. Then, Titus, one of the Roman rulers, appeared and defeated the, Jews, and took possession of their realm. He destroyed Jerusalem and the temple there. The place where the temple had been standing he ordered to be turned into a field. Then, the religion of the Messiah was adopted by the Romans. It became their religious practice to venerate the Messiah, Jesus. The Roman rulers vacillated, adopting Christianity at one time and giving it up at another until Constantine appeared 77 his mother Helena became a Christian 78 she traveled to Jerusalem in search of the wood upon which the Messiah had been crucified, in the opinion of, the Christians. 
The priest's 79 informed her that his cross had been thrown to the ground and had been covered with excrements and filth. She discovered the wood and built the church of the excrements 80 over the place where those excrements had been. The church is considered by the Christians to stand upon the grave of the Messiah. Helena destroyed the parts of the house, the temple, that she found standing. She ordered dung and excrements to be thrown upon the rock, until it was entirely covered and its sight obscured. That she considered the proper reward for what, the Jews, had done to the grave of the Messiah. Opposite the, church of the, excrements, they later on built Bethlehem, the house where Jesus was born 81 things remained this way until the coming of Islam and the Muslim conquest. Omer was present at the conquest of Jerusalem, and he asked to see the rock. The place was shown to him. It was piled high with dung and earth. He had it laid bare, and he built upon it a mosque in the Bedouin style. He gave it as much veneration as God allowed and as befitted its excellence, as preordained and established in the divine Quran. 82 Al-Walid B. Abd al-Malik later on devoted himself to constructing the mosque of, the rock, in the style of the Muslim mosques, as grandly as God wanted him to do it. He had done the same with the mosque in Mecca and the mosque of the Prophet in Medina, as well as the mosque of Damascus. The Arabs used to call, the Mosque of Damascus, the nave, ballot, of Al-Walid 83 Al-Walid compelled the Byzantine emperor to send workers and money for the building of these mosques, and they, the Byzantine artisans, were to embellish them with mosaics. The Byzantine emperor complied, and the construction of the mosques was able to materialize according to plan. During the 5th-11th century and, especially, at the end of it, the power of the caliphate weakened. Jerusalem was in the possession of the Ubaidid, Fatimids, the Shia Caliphs of Cairo. Their power, too, crumbled. The European Christians advanced toward Jerusalem and took possession of it. They also took possession of all the border cities of Syria. Upon the Holy Rock they built a church which they venerated and in the construction of which they took great pride. Eventually, Salah ad-Din b. Ayyub al-Kurdi became the independent ruler of Egypt and Syria. He wiped out the influence and heresy of the Ubaidid, Fatimids. He advanced toward Syria and waged the holy war against the European Christians there. He deprived them of possession of Jerusalem and the other border cities of Syria they were holding. This took place around the year 580-1184-85. Salah Adin destroyed the Christian church uncovered the rock, and rebuilt the mosque in about the same form in which it is still standing at this time. One should not bother about the famous problem arising from the sound tradition that the Prophet, when he was asked about the first house to be erected, replied, first Mecca, and then Jerusalem. And when he was asked how long the time interval between the two buildings had been, he replied, 40 years. 84. Now, the interval between the construction of Mecca and the construction of Jerusalem corresponds to the interval between Abraham and Solomon, because it was Solomon who built the temple in Jerusalem. That is considerably more than a thousand years. It should be known that the word erected that is used in the tradition was not intended to refer to construction, but it was intended to refer to the first house to be specially designated for divine worship. It is not an unlikely assumption that Jerusalem was designated for divine worship a long time, such as, the period mentioned, before Solomon, built his temple. It has been reported that the Sabians built a temple to Venus upon the rock. That was perhaps because, Jerusalem, was, already, a place of divine worship. In the same way, pre-Islamic, Arabs, placed idols and statues in and around the Kansas Ba. The Sabians who built the Temple of Venus lived in the time of Abraham. It is, therefore, not an unlikely assumption that there was an interval of 40 years between the time when Mecca was made a place of divine worship and the time when the same occurred in Jerusalem, even if there was no building there, at that early date, as is well known. The first to build, a temple in, Jerusalem was Solomon. This should be understood as it is the solution to the problem raised by the tradition. Medina, 
a city that was, originally, called Yathrib, was built by Yathrib B. Malail, Mahalalal, an Amalekite, and named after him. The children of Israel took Medina away from the Amalekites, together with the other parts of the Hijaz of which they took possession. Then, the Aws and the Hezraj, descendants of Kala 85 who belonged to the Ghassanids, settled as neighbors of the children of Israel in Arabia, and took Medina and its castles away from them. Because of God's preordained concern for Medina, the Prophet was commanded to emigrate there, and he did so in the company of Abu Bakr. The men around him followed him. He settled there and built his mosque and his houses in the place God had prepared for that purpose, and had predestined since eternity for that honor. The descendants of Kayla received him hospitably and helped him. Therefore, they were called the helpers, Al Ansar. Islam spread from Medina and eventually gained the upper hand over all other organizations. Muhammad defeated his own people. He conquered Mecca and took possession of it. The helpers thought that he would now move away from them and return to his own country. 86 This thought weighed upon them. However, the Messenger of God addressed 87 them and informed them that he would not move. Thus, when he died, he was even buried in Medina. In praise of Medina's excellence, there exist sound traditions, as everybody knows. Scholars disagree as to whether Medina should be considered as more excellent than Mecca. Malik expressed himself in favor of Medina, because he accepted the clear statement to that effect on the authority of Rafi B. Kudayoy, 88 which said that the Prophet had said, Medina is better than Mecca. This tradition, was transmitted by Abd al-Wahhab 89 in the Ma'ana. There are other such traditions the explicit wording of which indicates the same thing. Abu Hanifa and Ash Shafi'i were of a different opinion. At any rate, Medina, comes right after the sacred mosque, of Mecca. The hearts of people everywhere long for it. One should see how, through God's preordained concern for them, these venerated mosques are gradated in their excellence, and one should understand God's secret, plans, with regard to, his, creation and the well-considered gradation he established for the affairs of, the religion and the world. We have no information about any mosque on earth other than these three, save for stories about the mosque of Adam on the Indian island of Ceylon. But there exists no well-established information about that mosque upon which one may rely. The ancient nations had mosques which they venerated in what they thought to be a spirit of religious devotion. There were the fire temples of the Persians and the temples of the Greeks and the houses of the Arabs in the Hijaz, which the Prophet ordered destroyed on his raids. al Masudi mentioned some of them 90 we have no occasion whatever to mention them. They are not sanctioned by a religious law. They have nothing to do with religion. No attention is paid to them or to their history. In connection with them, the information contained in historical works is enough. Whoever wants to have historical information, about them, should consult, the historical works. God guides whomever he wants to guide. 91. 7. There are few cities and towns 92 in Afrikiya and the Makrib. The reason for this is that these regions belonged to the Berbers for thousands of years before Islam. All, there, civilization was a Bedouin, civilization. No sedentary culture existed among, the Berbers, long enough to reach any degree of perfection. The dynasties of European Christians and Arabs who ruled, the Berbers, did not rule long enough for their sedentary culture to take firm root, among them. The customs and ways of Bedouin life to which they were always closer, continued among them. Therefore, they did not have many buildings. Furthermore, crafts were unfamiliar to the Berbers, because they were firmly rooted in desert life, and the crafts result from sedentary culture. Now, buildings can materialize only with the help of, the crafts. One needs skill to learn them, and since the Berbers did not practice them, they had no interest in buildings, let alone towns. Furthermore, the Berbers, have, various, group feelings and, 
common, descent. No, Berber group, lacks these things. Common, descent and group feeling are more attracted to desert, than to urban life. Only tranquility and quiet call for towns. The inhabitants of, towns, come to be dependent on their militia. Therefore, desert people dislike settling in a town or staying there. Only luxury and wealth could cause them to settle in a town, and these things are rare among men. Thus, the whole civilization of Afrikiya and the Makrib, or the largest part of it, was a Bedouin one. People lived in tents, camel, litters, sleeping tents, and mountain fastnesses. On the other hand, the whole civilization of the non-Arab countries, or the largest part of it, was one of villages, cities, and districts. This applies to Spain, Syria, Egypt, the non-Arab Iraq, and similar countries. Only in the rarest cases do non-Arabs have a, common, descent which they guard carefully and of which they are proud when it is pure and close. It is mostly people of, common, descent who settle in the desert, because close, common, descent constitutes closer and stronger, bonds than any other element. Thus, the group feeling that goes with, common descent, likewise is, stronger. It draws those who have it to desert life and the avoidance of cities, which do away with bravery and make people dependent upon others. This should be understood and the proper conclusions be drawn from it. 8. The buildings and constructions in Islam are Comparatively few considering, Islam's, power and as compared to the dynasties preceding, Islam. The reason for this is the very same thing that we mentioned concerning the Berbers 93 The Arabs, too, are quite firmly rooted in the desert and quite unfamiliar with the crafts. Furthermore, before Islam, the Arabs had been strangers to the realms of which they then took possession. When they came to rule them, there was not time 94 enough for all the institutions of sedentary culture to develop fully. Moreover, the buildings of others which they found in existence, were sufficient for them. Furthermore, at the beginning, there, religion forbade them to do any excessive building or to waste too much money on building activities for no purpose. When the reeds which the Muslims had used before, in building Al-Kufa, caught fire, and the Muslims asked Umar for permission to use stones, his advice was. Do but no one should build more than three houses 95 do not vie with each other in building. Adhere to the Sunnah, and you will remain in power. He imposed this, condition, upon the delegation, and then he ordered the people not to build buildings higher than was proper. Asked what proper was, he replied, what does not lead you to wastefulness and does not take you away from purposeful moderation? The influence of the religion, Islam, and of scrupulousness in such matters then faded. Royal authority and luxury gained the upper hand. The Arabs subjected the Persian nation and took over their constructions and buildings. The tranquility and luxury they now enjoyed led them to, building activities. It was at that time that they erected buildings and, large, constructions. But that also was the period close to the destruction of the dynasty. There was only a little time left for extensive building activities and town and city planning. This had not been the case with other nations. The Persians had had a period of thousands of years. The same was the case with the Copts, the Nabataeans, and the Romans, Byzantines, Rum, as well as the first Arabs, Ad and Tahmud, the Amalekites, and the Tubas. They had a great deal of time and the crafts became firmly established among them. Thus, their buildings and monuments were more numerous and left a more lasting imprint, than the buildings of the Muslim Arabs. Upon close scrutiny, this will be found to be as I have stated. God inherits the earth and whomever is upon it. 9. Buildings erected by Arabs, with very few exceptions. Quickly fall into ruins. The reason for this is the Bedouin attitude and unfamiliarity with the crafts, as we have mentioned before 96 therefore, the buildings, of the Arabs, are not solidly built. There may be another aspect, 
more pertinent to the problem. That is, as we have stated, 97 that the Arabs pay little attention in town planning to making the right choice with regard to the site, of the town, the quality of the air, the water, the fields, and the pastures, belonging to it. Differences with respect to these things make the difference between good and bad cities as regards natural civilization. The Arabs have no interest in these things. They only see to it that they have pastures for their camels. They do not care whether the water is good or bad, whether there is little or much of it. They do not ask about the suitability of the fields, the vegetable plots, and the air, because they, are used to, moving about the country and importing their grain from remote places. In the desert the wines blow from all directions, and the fact that the Arabs travel about guarantees them wines of good quality. Wines turn bad only when people settle and stay in one place and there are many superfluities there. One may cite the Arabs' planning of Al-Kufa, Al-Basra, and al Kairawan. All they looked for when planning, those cities, was pasturage for their camels and nearness to the desert and the caravan routes. Thus, those cities, do not possess a natural site. They had no sources from which to feed their civilization, population, later on. Such a source must exist if civilization is to continue, as we have stated before 98 the sites of, those cities, were not naturally suited for settlement. They were not situated in the midst of nations capable of repopulating them, once their original population started to disintegrate. At the first intimations of the disintegration of, Arab, power and of the disappearance of the group feeling that protected them, those cities, fell prey to ruin and disintegration and were as if they had never been. God decides, and no one can change his decision. 99. 10. The Beginnings of the Ruin of Cities It should be known that when cities are first founded, they have few dwellings and few building materials, such as stones and quicklime, or the things that serve as ornamental coverings for walls, such as tiles, marble, mosaic, jet. 100 shells, mother of pearl, and glass. Thus, at that time, the buildings are built in Bedouin, style, and the materials used for them are perishable. Then, the civilization of a city grows and its inhabitants increase in number. Now the materials used for, building, increase, because of the increase in, available, labor and the increased number of craftsmen. This process goes on, until, the city, reaches the limit in that respect, as was discussed before. The civilization of the city then recedes, and its inhabitants decrease in number. This entails a decrease in the crafts. As a result, good and solid building and the ornamentation of buildings are no longer practiced. Then, the, available, labor decreases, because of the lack of inhabitants. Materials such as stones, marble, and other things, are now being imported scarcely at all, and, building materials, become unavailable. The materials that are in the existing buildings are reused for building and refinishing. They are transferred from one construction to another, since most of the, large, constructions, castles, and mansions stand empty as the result of the scarcity of civilization, population, and the great decrease in, population as compared with former times. The same materials, continue to be used for one castle after another and for one house after another, until most of it is completely used up. People then return to the Bedouin way of building. They use adobe instead of stone and omit all ornamentation. The architecture of the city reverts to that of villages and hamlets. The mark of the desert shows in it. The city, then gradually decays and falls into complete ruin, if it is thus destined for it. This is how God proceeds with his creatures. 11. With regard to the amount of prosperity and business. Activity, in them, cities and towns differ in accordance with the different size of their civilization, population. The 101 reason for this is that, as is known and well established, the individual human being cannot by himself obtain all the necessities of life. 
All human beings must cooperate to that end in their civilization 102 but what is obtained through the cooperation of a group of human beings satisfies the need of a number many times greater, than themselves. For instance, no one, by himself, can obtain the share of the wheat he needs for food. But when six or ten persons, including a smith and a carpenter to make the tools, and others who are in charge of the oxen, the plowing of the soil, the harvesting of the ripe grain, and all the other agricultural activities. Undertake to obtain their food and work toward that purpose either separately or collectively and thus obtain through their labor a certain amount of food, that amount, will be food for a number of people many times their own. The combined labor produces more than the needs and necessities of the workers. If the labor 103 of the inhabitants of a town or city is distributed in accordance with the necessities and needs of those inhabitants, a minimum of that labor will suffice. The labor, available, is more than is needed. Consequently, it is spent to provide the conditions and customs of luxury and to satisfy the needs of the inhabitants of other cities. They import, the things they need, from, people who have a surplus, through exchange or purchase. Thus, the people who have a surplus, get a good deal of wealth. It will become clear in the fifth chapter, which deals with profit and sustenance, 104 that profit is the value realized from labor. When there is more labor, the value realized from it increases among the people. Thus, their profit of necessity increases. The prosperity and wealth they enjoy leads them to luxury and the things that go with it such as splendid houses and clothes, fine vessels and utensils, and the use of servants and mounts. All these, things, involve activities that require their price. 105 and skillful people must be chosen to do them and be in charge of them. As a consequence, industry and the crafts thrive. The income and the expenditure of the city increase. Affluence comes to those who work and produce these things by their labor. When civilization, population, increases, the, available, labor again increases. In turn, luxury again increases in correspondence with the increasing profit, and the customs and needs of luxury increase. Crafts are created to obtain, luxury products. The value realized from them increases, and, as a result, profits are again multiplied in the town. Production there is thriving even more than before. And so it goes with the second and third increase. All the additional labor serves luxury and wealth, in contrast to the original labor that served, the necessities of, life. The city that is superior to another in one, aspect of, civilization, that is, in population, becomes superior to it also by its increased profit and prosperity and by its customs of luxury which are not found in the other city. The more numerous and the more abundant the civilization, population, in a city, the more luxurious is the life of its inhabitants in comparison with that, of the inhabitants, of a lesser city. This applies equally to all levels of the population, to the judges, of the one city, compared with the judges, of the other city, to the merchants, of the one city, compared with the merchants, of the other city, and, as with the judges and merchants, so with the artisans, the small businessmen, emirs, and policemen. This may be exemplified, for instance, in the Macrib, by comparing the situation of Fez with other Macribi cities, such as Bougie, Tlemcen, and Ceuta. A wide difference, both in general and in detail will be found to exist between, them and Fez. The situation of a judge in Fez is better than that of a judge in Tlemcen, and the same is the case with all other population groups. The same difference exists between Tlemcen on the one hand and Oran or Algiers on the other, and between Oran or Algiers and lesser cities, until one gets down to the hamlets where people have only the necessities of life through their labor, or not even enough of them. The only reason for this is the difference in the labor, available, in, the different cities. They all are a sort of market for their labor, products, and the money spent in each market corresponds to, the volume of business done in it. The income of a judge in Fez suffices for his expenditures, 
and the same is the case with a judge in Tlemcen. Wherever income and expenditure, combined, are greater, conditions are better and more favorable. Income and expenditure, are greater in Fez, since its production thrives because of luxury requirements, there. Therefore, greater opulence exists, in Fez. The same applies to Oran, Constantine, Algiers, and Biskra, until, as we have stated, one gets down to the cities whose labor does not pay for their necessities. They cannot be considered cities. They belong to the category of villages and hamlets. Therefore, the inhabitants of such small cities are found to be in a weak position and all equally poor and indigent, because their labor does not pay for their necessities and does not yield them a surplus which they can accumulate as profit. They have no increasing profit. Thus, with very few exceptions, they are poor and needy. This can, even, be exemplified by the condition of the poor and the beggars. A beggar in Fez is better off than a beggar in Tlemcen or Oran. I observed beggars in Fez who, at the time of the sacrifices, of the ID festival, begged for enough to buy their sacrificial animals. I saw them beg for many kinds of luxuries and delicacies such as meat, butter, cooked dishes, garments, and utensils, such as sieves and vessels. If a beggar were to ask for such things in Tlemcen or Oran, he would be considered with disapproval and treated harshly and chased away. At this time, we hear astonishing things about conditions in Cairo and Egypt as regards luxury and wealth in the customs of the inhabitants there. Many of the poor in the Maghrib even want to move to Egypt on account of that and because they hear that prosperity in Egypt is greater than anywhere else. The common people believe that this is so because property is abundant in those regions, 106 and, their inhabitants, have much property hoarded, and are more charitable and bountiful than the inhabitants of any other city. However, this is not so, but, as one knows, the reason is that the civilization, population, of Egypt and Cairo is larger than that of any other city one might think of. Therefore, the inhabitants of Egypt, enjoy better, living, conditions. Income and expenditure balance each other in every city. If the income is large, the expenditure is large, and vice versa. And if both income and expenditure are large, the inhabitants become more favorably situated, and the city grows. No, phenomenon, of this sort one may hear about should be denied, but all these things should be understood to be the result of much civilization and the resulting great profits which facilitate spending and giving bounties to those who ask for them. This might be compared with the difference existing in one and the same town with regard to the houses dumb animals keep away from or frequent. The premises and courtyards of the houses of the prosperous and wealthy, inhabitants of the town, who set a good table and where grain and bread crumbs lie scattered around, are frequented by swarms of ants and insects. There are many large rats in their cellars, and cats repair to them 107 flocks of birds circle over them and eventually leave, satiated and full with food and drink. But, in the premises of the houses of the indigent and the poor who have little sustenance, no insect crawls about and no bird hovers in the air and no rat or cat takes refuge in the cellars 108 of such houses, for, as, the poet, said. The bird swoops down where there is grain to pick up and frequents the mansions of noble, generous, persons. 109. God's secret, plan, in this respect should be scrutinized. One may compare the swarms of human beings with the swarms of dumb animals, and the crumbs from tables with the surplus of sustenance and luxury and the ease with which it can be given away by the people who have it, because as a rule they can do without it, since they have more of it. It should be known that favorable conditions and much prosperity in civilization are the results of its large size. God has no need of the worlds. 110